The suspect in the second attempt on former President Trump's life was in court today after a letter was discovered detailing his plans. Prosecutors say 58-year-old Ryan Ruth sent the letter months prior to his attempt earlier this month. Court just wrapped up, so for the very, very latest, we're bringing in the Hill's courts and legal reporter Zach Schoenfeld. Zach, what happened in court today and what can we expect to happen to Ruth moving forward? This big hearing just wrapped up just a few moments before we started talking. And the bottom line is that the judge has ruled that the suspect here will remain in custody ahead of trial. That was the main subject of today's hearing, uh, where prosecutors argued that he would be a danger uh, if he was let out to go on release. They pointed out that not only is he charged in this case, but even before this incident at Trump's golf course, he already had a felony record in North Carolina. So it's a big win for prosecutors here today, as they are now able to keep the suspect behind bars. It's probably pretty expected that they're not going to want him back out on the streets, considering what he's accused of. But let's go back to that letter. It was actually sent months ago. Walk us through what was in that letter, and why is it just being discovered now? This letter is the most direct evidence to date that Ryan Routh was indeed attempting to assassinate the former president. It was revealed in a court document earlier today, actually in support of this hearing today, where prosecutors uh, were going to talk about his detention as part of their evidence of showing why they believed he needed to remain behind bars. But this was a letter that he allegedly wrote months ago, before the incident, in which he uh, d directed it. He said, it, he said, Dear world, this is an assassination attempt. Uh, so certainly a very striking letter there, uh, and starting to get the answer answers to these key questions uh, of exactly how much was this premeditated. Uh, and it certainly seems like that the evidence of that prosecutors have now put forward, uh, not only the letter, but they also say that cell phone records showed that uh, he was near Trump's golf course in his Mar-a-Lago residence in the weeks leading up to this is incident. So certainly a lot more evidence coming to light, suggesting that this was indeed a premeditated attack. Let's shift to the presidential election. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. just filed a, an appeal to get his name back on the ballot in New York. What's going on here? Yeah, there's a lot of noise going on right now with Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s ballot access now that he has suspended his independent campaign for president. He is seeking to remove his name from the ballot in key swing states, but he wants his name to remain on the ballot elsewhere. So in a place like New York, where it's a deep blue state, he's trying to remain on the ballot. But he was taken off because challengers got judges to agree uh, that the residency that he put on his uh, ballot petition there was invalid, saying that it was not of uh, his fixed and permanent address. So if lower court rulings are allowed to stand. He won't be on the ballot. But today, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign went to the Supreme Court asking for an emergency intervention to put him back on the ballot. This is a very high standard that he's going to have to clear here. We actually just saw a similar case from the Green Party where Jill Stein was hoping to get back on Nevada's ballot and the judges declined that request without any noted dissents. So now we'll have to see what and wait to see what they do with RFK's request. Any theories on why he could be doing this? I mean, he's endorsed President Trump now, so theoretically he's trying to help him win this election. But New York's not really in play. What's he doing? Yeah, I mean, I think here and we've seen third party and ballot access really play this outsized role uh, in this election. You know, take, for example, the Jill Stein request that just went through the Supreme Court. She was represented by Jay Sekulow, who's a Trump aligned lawyer uh, who represented her or uh, who represented him in his first impeachment trial. Uh, so even though we're actually talking about third party candidates, there's lots of accusations flying back and forth that, you know, Democrats are funding certain lawsuits and that Republicans are secretly, you know, backing others uh, as both sides really try to get the ballots in the way that they think will help them come November. The old adage that politics makes strange bedfellows. Zach Schoenfeld, thanks so much for coming on. We appreciate you joining us. Good to be with you. More than 270 people are dead and another 700 are injured after a series of Israeli airstrikes early Monday morning in southern Lebanon. That's according to the Lebanese Health Ministry. The Israeli Defense Forces said Monday in a post on social media that they struck 300 targets of the militant group Hezbollah. It comes less than a week after Israel detonated hundreds of pagers and handheld radio devices across Lebanon. Those attacks killed at least 37 people, including several Hezbollah militants, and wounded thousands of others. On Friday, Israel also carried out targeted strikes in Beirut that killed top Hezbollah commanders. Hezbollah retaliated over the weekend by firing dozens of missiles at Israel. One Israeli man was wounded in that attack. The latest polling in the presidential race has some positive news for Donald Trump in key Sunbelt swing states. According to the New York Times Siena College poll of likely voters, Trump holds a five-point lead in Arizona, a four-point lead in Georgia, and a two-point lead in North Carolina. Joining us to discuss the Hill congressional reporter Michael Schnell. Michael, if you look at the polling averages in the Sunbelt, it's essentially a toss-up. Um, what I take from that is that the debate, which many people think that Harris won, didn't really have an impact 
on this election? Well, I think that there's always the debate about how much do debates actually matter? Do they actually lead in that boost in the polls? I think a lot of folks would also caution you to look at just one poll in particular and wait to see uh, what a group of them show and what sort of the, the main theme of that the, that group of post-debate polls show. But I think that it, it's helped with the narrative and helped give the Harris campaign a boost in her step, right? We've seen her confidence on the campaign trail. We've seen her reference and talk about the debate. And now, of course, we're having another debate about the debates as Kamala Harris has accepted this invitation from CNN to debate on October 23rd and former President Donald Trump has declined that invitation. So I mean, while it may not be reflected in the polls, the Harris campaign definitely has a pep in their step because of the results of that debate. Let's talk a little bit more about that poll because Harris is doing better in the so-called blue wall states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. But some Dems worry that Trump's popularity in those states could be underestimated. What are they saying? I think that there's, you know, a lot of cautious optimism. If Democrats even want to use that O word of optimism, I think that a lot of folks are spooked about 2016 and 2020, 2016. Democrats feeling really good about Hillary Clinton's chances, especially in those blue wall states, and then losing their grip on Election Day. And back in 2020, former President Trump doing better than folks had expected in some of those states. So while the polling looks pretty good for Kamala Harris right now, it's important to note that a lot of those numbers are still within the margin of error. And if they're not, they're very close to that margin of error. Nothing's a runaway. And if we've spoken about how close this election is, I think that Democrats right now just don't want to get too giddy and take their eye off the ball and get too comfortable and overconfident because there's still plenty of time left in this campaign. There is this interesting, plausible scenario where Trump wins the Sun Belt, Harris wins the Rust Belt, and everything could come down to Nebraska. Uh, GOP Senator Lindsey Graham was in Nebraska last week. Donald Trump has tweeted about this. It could come down just to a few state lawmakers as it pertains to what actually happens here set the landscape and why people are so focused on Nebraska all of a sudden. Yeah, so Nebraska is one of those interesting states where they don't have winner take all. Their five electoral votes are determined on a different basis. Two of them will go to the candidate that wins the state and the other three will be based off of uh, congressional districts. So Republican members of Congress are now making this push to make it that it's a winner take all style. They want to be able to change the rules for that winner take all. Whether or not it will be successful, we'll have to see. But I think this also reflects just the close nature of this election that Republicans are worrying about five electoral votes in Nebraska. Of course, there's still plenty of campaigning happening in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, even Texas, Florida. But folks think it's going to be really close. So five electoral votes, that could be the whole name of the game this cycle. Yeah, and that one um, congressional district that centers around Omaha, Democrats have had some success there in the past. So it'll be interesting to see what the state legislature does and whether that could actually have an impact come November. The Democratic National Committee is launching a billboard campaign calling Donald Trump a chicken after he declined an invitation to debate Kamala Harris for a second time. There are mobile billboards that will be out in Pennsylvania today while Trump is campaigning. Trump says he's not going to debate again, but it seems like the Harris campaign isn't completely convinced that he'll stick to that. What do you think about the debate over whether there's going to be another debate? <laughs> it's it's Washington's favorite pastime where when, we're, when we are in an election year, um, whenever we're in a 2022, 2024, there's always this debate about the debates. We're seeing it play out once again. I think that this goes back to what we were talking about before, the fact that Kamala Harris's campaign has this pep in their step, this confidence after the first debate. Pundits, large majority of folks, lawmakers on Capitol Hill, Republicans who I spoke to privately, they said that they thought it was very clear that Kamala Harris did a better job than Donald Trump. She was successful in laying that bait for the former president, which he took. They were six, she, she was successful in getting him off his game and getting him to, you know, to, to go off into these tangents. So clearly the Kamala Harris campaign wants to put their candidate on the debate stage. Donald Trump balking at that. Now, look, is this a done deal? Probably not. I think there's still a chance for this continued back and forth. There was only, you know, one debate in this cycle that would, uh, with these two candidates, rather, because the change with President Biden, which would be a, a bit of a low number. I think we'll continue to see this debate in this play out. But again, this shows the confidence of the Harris campaign with their candidate on the debate stage. And it's, I think, a fallout and a continuation of her successful performance in the first debate. You talked about Harris baiting Trump in the debate. Can she debate, uh, uh, bait him into debating again is kind of the question that we're at now. I mean, potentially, look, these billboards may make a dent in how he's feeling. You know, we know that the former president doesn't love these personal attacks as much as he lobs them towards other people. Sometimes they can go and, and get to the heart of him. We saw that on the debate stage, Kamala Harris talking about his net worth, Kamala Harris talking about his crowd size at his rallies. This is something that can sometimes get in time to, inside his brain. Will there not be successful? I have no idea. But I mean, 
October 23rd. That's a lifetime away. There's still plenty of time. This race could be dramatically different at that point. More than 700 high-ranking national security officials have endorsed Kamala Harris for president. Those officials call Harris somebody that has leadership qualities needed to be a strong commander-in-chief. On Trump, they say he has a scary authoritarian streak. Michael, who are these national security officials, and do you think what they're saying here could have any impact on the campaign? It's a large group. As you mentioned, it's more than 700 of these national security officials, and they're essentially saying that they see Kamala Harris as a strong leader, and they don't see Donald Trump in the same sense. I'll read part of the letter. I think it's important to read the words. Quote, Vice President Harris has all the leadership qualities needed to be a strong commander-in-chief. She's prepared. She's strategic. She understands all sides of the issue. Continues, as we've seen for nearly a decade. However, former President Trump has none of those qualities, and he has a scary authoritarian streak. So they're really hitting at this idea of national security. It's sort of an idea that hits home with Republicans, right? Because Republicans always see themselves as strong on the national stage, strong on foreign policy, strong arm, you know, strong on the national security stage in the U.S. So I think the Harris campaign is hoping that that will hit that cohort of voters, potentially disaffected Republicans who are looking for a new candidate to support. I think this goes in the column of folks like Liz Cheney, folks like Dick Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, Republicans who have endorsed uh, Kamala Harris. I'm not saying these are all these are all Republicans, um, but just that idea of trying to hit those, you know, maybe moderate leaning conservative voters who are disaffected with Trump. I would imagine that's something that they're hoping plays pretty well in the suburbs where Harris is trying to make a play for those moderate leaning Republicans. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that they're hoping that, you know, again, we keep talking about how this election is going to be so close. The national polls show it. The state-by-state -state surveys show it. Any group of voters, especially those independent voters and the undecided voters who we really don't come by so, so often, those could be a, a gold mine for these campaigns. Donald Trump says he won't run for election again if he loses the 2024 race. Trump would be 82 by 2028. So it seems pretty implausible, especially since he would have lost two elections in the row in a row. But Michael, Trump's grip on the GOP is pretty strong. If he were to lose in this race, what do you think his future in the party is? And could you see a scenario where he does in fact try to mount another campaign in 2028? I'm not sure what his future in the party would be. Be. Because remember, we had the Republican Party before Trump came on stage and before Trump went down that escalator. And then once he entered the political arena, for a little time he was sort of an outsider before he had picked up support when folks like Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio were leading the pack in the 2016 primary. He very quickly swarmed, uh, you know, uh, flew to the top of that list and became the quasi leader of the Republican Party when he was president, when he was even not president during the Joe Biden administration. So I don't know what a Republican Party will look like with, 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 former President Trump not being in the White House, not running, but still being a prominent figure because we just haven't seen that yet. But I do think that in terms of the MAGA movement, I mean, he has set up J.D. Vance to be the heir apparent of that movement when he selected him as his running mate. Now, I think there's a big question that if former President Trump loses in November, will the Republican Party continue with the MAGA movement or will they abandon it? Because as you mentioned, it would be a two-time loser. Uh, there were problems with, you know, Republicans were expecting to have better majority in the House. Republicans had hoped to take the Senate. Um, there are a lot of questions about if the MAGA movement has been effective for the Republican Party. So I'm interested in seeing, A, where President Trump would, would find himself in the GOP if he were to lose, but B, also if the Republican Party would move away from this MAGA movement, maybe more towards somebody like Liz Cheney or Nikki Haley, or if they'd stick with it. And I think a big per, the big determinant of the, those questions are going to be the base, because that is really the foundation of the Republican Party. Yeah, it'd be interesting point. to see if somebody within the Republican Party party challenges him kind of from the MAGA wing trying to take that mantle. We saw Ron DeSantis do that last election right. cycle. It was not ultimately successful, but I think if in a scenario where he loses again in 2024, there will be an appetite to challenge him from that wing of the party. Whether they can be successful is a whole different story as we saw this election cycle. Mark Robinson, a Republican candidate for governor in North Carolina, is under increasing pressure after a CNN report accused him of making a series of inflammatory posts, inflammatory posts on the message board of an adult website. In those posts, he called himself a black Nazi and said he wished for slavery to be reinstated. Now, Robinson has said this is not him making these posts. And over the weekend, we heard a lot from national Republicans kind of weighing in on this uh, race in North Carolina for governor. What are they saying? Yeah, so so someone I looked to, I, I looked at was Tom Tillis. He's Republican senator from North Carolina, and he said that if these allegations are false, then then Mark Robinson should take it upon himself to to go the legal route against CNN. But if they're true, this is not somebody who should be 
you know, a, a leading contender for the Republican Party. And I think that we're really starting to hear that from a lot of Republican lawmakers trying to distance themselves from this. We saw, as you mentioned, a number of his campaign staff members, Mark Robinson's campaign staff members, reside. And we saw even former President Trump and J.D. Vance try to distance themselves from this. Trump was in North Carolina rallying there, and he ticked off a number of Republican uh, North Carolina politicians. Notably, Mark Robinson was missing from that list. Mark Robinson not appearing with the former president there. We had J.D. Vance, who was spotted in the Capitol walking to the Capitol physician's office last week, and a reporter shouted a question to him, what's your reaction to the Mark Robinson allegations? He didn't respond. Uh, the clip went a bit viral on social media. So afterwards, he responded to the viral clip and he said, my response on uh, Mark Robinson is that Kamala Harris is the one who cast the tie-breaking vote for the Inflation Reduction Act. A completely different matter, legislation, this is politics, you know, completely different matter. It just shows that the campaign is trying to distance itself from it and sort of turn the page and try to shift the narrative. So I expect to hear more criticism and condemnation from Republicans, but also by and large trying to just separate themselves from this it. This is not just being looked out in, in a context of North Carolina. North Carolina is a swing state. It could play an important role in the presidential election. Do you think that this scandal, possible scandal involving the, this gubernatorial candidate could have an impact on the presidential race uh, because it's going to be probably a pretty close race and maybe there's some bleed over into, into the presidential race from this fallout. I mean, it's entirely possible. You talk about North Carolina, there could be turnout matters or folks that, you know, were maybe going to go in to vote for Mark Robinson. Now the Republicans, now they won't go in at all. There are always those questions about turnout. Also, you know, note the Harris campaign has been trying to tie Trump to Mark Robinson. Trump notably endorsed Mark Robinson previously for North Carolina governor. Donald Trump previously compared Mark Robinson to Martin Luther King Jr. So we saw the Harris campaign pretty quickly put together this ad noting the closest between the two. Now, is that going to be a turnoff for some Republican voters or just independent, undecided voters? I don't know, but it's, of course, entirely a possibility. Interesting fact to consider is Democrat Roy Cooper won in both 2016 and 2020 right. in elections that Donald Trump also won. So could there be another split ticket situation? We'll be watching North Carolina very closely. Georgia Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock says a new law in the state requiring hand counting of voting ballots is an effort to turn democracy on its head. Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger is also against the move. Michael, how do we get here and what is the worry from these Democrats including Senator Warnock. Yeah, so essentially what we saw was the Georgia Board of Elections, they ruled on Friday that ballots have to be hand counted uh, by, by local precincts, despite there were concerns from election officials and opposition from some state party officials. Uh, the Georgia Election Board ruled three to two to require those hand ballots to be, those ballots to be hand counted in the local precincts. And, you know, it's, it's an added layer to the county that happens from the machine. So there were some concerns that, you know, that this change could, that this rule change could influence the process for how things work. I mean, we are, remember, very close to Election Day, only less than 50 days away now. So any change in process is going to be uh, significant and could be significant. So interesting, of course, Georgia was sort of the hotspot for former President Trump's uh, claims that the election was stolen, that infamous phone call between him and uh, and um, between him and officials there in Georgia, uh, where he said, can you find me the votes that I need to win? So Georgia is definitely going to be a place where there's going to be a lot of focus when we get closer to the election and then afterwards as votes are being counted. In an interesting scenario where you have the Republican leading early and in these big city centers where it takes longer to count a lot of votes that the Democrat ends up catching up and you could just see how that would play out over uh, se several days in the in the drama that, that could build up in a state like that. But uh, Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson is giving up on his push to include a controversial voting bill in a funding package meant to avoid a government shutdown. Johnson is now offering up a clean funding package that would last through December 20th. Uh, he's essentially punting the debate over spending until after the presidential election. What do you make of, of where we've come throughout this kind of fight over spending and what impact the election could have on where they end up going after December 20th. My main takeaway is refundable plane tickets, because let me tell you, it's going to be Christmas in Washington, very likely come December. Uh, the December 20th deadline is just days before Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So on one hand, lawmakers may try to get their work done so they can head back to their families and celebrate the holidays. On the other hand, this is Washington. This is hardball politics. This is lame duck politics. Um, there could be some issues and this funding fight could get messy. Essentially, last week, Speaker Mike Johnson tried to pass that six-month stopgap uh, paired with the SAVE Act legislation that would require non-U.S. Uh, non that would 
require a proof of citizenship to vote in U.S. elections. He tried to pass that through the House as a way to start negotiations with Senate Democrats. Um, but a group of 14 Republicans joined with mostly all Democrats to vote down that legislation. There was concern from hardline Republicans that the bill didn't cut spending, and there was concern from defense hawks that the six-month timeline would have a negative effect on funding at the Pentagon. So then Johnson had to go back to square one, and he ended up huddling with leaders from the House, from the, House, from the Senate, both parties, and they came up with this three-month continuing resolution. It's largely clean, and as you mentioned, it'll fund government to December 20th. We expect that to pass sometime this week, potentially over the weekend, but we expect this to pass and to avert a government shutdown, but it's going to set up this funding fight now for December. And you mentioned the elections. That's going to play such a key role here because, you know, whoever wins the White House will have, if former President Trump wins the White House, uh, he will have, you know, more of a say on, he will have more influence, rather, on Republicans and how they go about this funding process. If Republicans keep the House, we're going to have these conversations about, well, who's going to be the next speaker? Will it be Mike Johnson? Will it not? And all of these decisions about funding are going to really influence whether or not Johnson can remain at the top of the House Republican conference. So there are a lot of moving pieces here. It is policy, but there's a ton of politics, and it's all going to heat up after the election. The motivation to leave for the holiday season is often something that gets things accomplished here in Washington, so it'll be interesting to see. Sometimes, not <laughs> only, but sometimes, yes. All right, The Hills Congressional Reporter, Michael Schnell, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Drew. The Biden administration is setting new rules for the auto industry meant to limit Chinese intelligence gathering in the United States. The new initiative announced Monday would ban Chinese-developed software from internet-connected cars in the U.S. The move is meant to prevent the Chinese government from monitoring the movements of Americans or using the cars as a way to access critical infrastructure. The Biden administration has already banned Chinese-based telecom giant Huawei from operating in the U.S. and prevented Chinese-made cranes from operating in American ports over the same concerns. Plastic bags will soon be banned in California grocery stores after Governor Gavin Newsom signed a new law over the weekend. It prohibits grocery and retail stores from providing plastic bags to customers at store checkouts. Customers who don't bring their own bags will be offered paper bags. It comes 10 years after a different California plastic bag law required stores to distribute reusable or recyclable plastic bags. But according to the California Public Interest Research Group, only 2% of customers were using plastic bags provided from stores. The new ban goes into effect in January of 2026. That's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Drew Petromo. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.